uh, with some information. Uh, try to fill in a few things that might not be immediately obvious on our website, but you can always go to the website and, and, and follow up and find even more specific things about when your um, application is due, details about the GRE. Shannon, our Chairman of Administrative Assistance, pointed out to me that there is one typo on your handout that is really very important, and that is that you must take the GRE by December 15 in order for us to get scores by December 31st um, so that your application can be complete. Um, so that's very, very important. Um, and if you haven't, if you're planning to apply and you haven't already signed up for the GREs, please, please go ahead and do that. Um, you know, you go to the GRE site, you put in your zip code, and it tells you the closest thing, and sometimes you have to play around a little bit. I just put in the zip code for Cambridge yesterday just to see, and the nearest testing facility with availability on December 15th was in Connecticut. I thought, oh boy, I hope everyone's on top of this. Um, but I will, I will add, not to totally panic you, that this is probably the area in the country where the most people in the U.S. take the GREs, because it's a brain trust. It's Cambridge and Boston, and we have so many universities. So uh, don't panic if you come from far away, but do go ahead and schedule that test if you've not done so already. Um, I am Heather Hendershot. I am the uh, Director of Graduate Studies for Comparative Media Studies. Hello, this is Kurt Pent. Feel free to sit there or pull up a chair. We're going to have people coming in and out a lot. My kids are really busy with this, so hopefully we can convey that sense of excitement. Someone's in, someone's out. Someone, you know, please in between meetings to come by and say hi and introduce themselves. Uh, Jim Wang is one of our professors who will introduce herself a little bit later. We've got a lab manager. We've got um, three students. So we've got a mix of people that will change throughout the, the next two hours. Um, I mentioned Shannon already, uh, our administrative assistant, who is the source of all knowledge. Uh, anything you can't figure out by asking me or looking for or whatever, Shannon can tell you. Um, so I'm going to uh, initially do something that I tell people never to do in PowerPoint presentations, which is to uh, say some of the things that are written right up behind me. <laughs> um, so bear with me. Uh, I'm going to give you a kind of brief overview of what comparative media studies is. Uh, we like to think that we address the challenges brought about by ongoing and fundamental changes in the technologies and practices of media production, distribution, and consumption. And rather than looking at medium-specific silos, we're trying to look at the dynamics of media change uh, in a comparative historical and multidisciplinary way across mediums. So uh, if you've been looking at other kinds of graduate programs over the country, you may have seen course, uh, programs in film studies or film and media studies or screen studies, which is, people thought was a really great solution to the coming of new media a few years ago. They're like, well, we used to just look at TV, but now we can look at film and uh, computer screens and handheld screens, and this will sort of cover everything. Um, and it's not a bad idea, um, except for audio, radio, um, different kinds of interfaces that, aren't, that are about media but aren't screen specific. So with comparative media studies, we tried to come up with a rubric that was more inclusive, more multidisciplinary, or transdisciplinary. Um, some people uh, are a little confused. They go to the website and they're like, CMS, what is this W? What's going on? Um, so I'll just explain that um, CMSW is a composite program. We had a merger in, uh, I believe it was 2012, uh, between comparative media studies and writing humanistic studies. And so what we have is two graduate programs and two undergraduate programs, right? Uh, the graduate program on the W side is uh, a science writing program, and then we have the comparative media studies side, and, those, and both of those graduate programs are masters of science degrees. Um, and then the undergrad degrees are you know, separate things. And uh, as a graduate student, you wouldn't necessarily interact with the undergrads, but it's neat to know that we have a pretty strong uh, undergraduate program. We have uh, among the highest numbers of, of majors in the humanities at MIT. People don't tend to come to MIT to study uh, literature or sociology, or you know they come here to, to learn engineering. Um, but the undergrads are required to take uh, eight humanities classes while they're here, two a year, which meet, which is very, uh, which is a lot for a technically oriented school. And they come to see the value of the humanities in a technically oriented uh, you know, 
academic environment. Um, and this makes us a really good place to be because we consider ourselves as sort of doing applied humanities, that we are humanities that make sense in the context of a, of a technologically oriented institute. Um, so we're based in SHAS, School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences. Um, MIT uh, overall was recently ranked one of the three best universities after Harvard and Stanford in the world for arts and humanities education by Time Tire Education, which is a leading British education magazine. I've heard of it. <laughs> and then we were ranked number one in the social sciences. So, uh, so uh, we're doing pretty well outside of just uh, the things you would think of immediately, like engineering um, and, and uh, uh, rocket design and space travel and so on. Um, the Comparative Media Studies program has graduated over 100 students at this point. Um, Andrew, do you know the exact number? Oh, geez, it's about 150 or 160. 150 or 160, yeah. okay. Another source of information, Andrew Ritter, our communications yeah. director. Um, I would say about 30% of those uh, master's students pursue doctoral degrees. We try to take about 10 a year, it depends upon funding, because we really like to fund everyone that we bring in. We want to cover your tuition, we want to provide you a research assistantship that will cover your cost of living expenses and so on, um, and we're, we're very committed to making that happen. So if we, can, if we have 10 we want, but we can only fund 8 or 9, then that is what we bring in. So that's the right thing to do. So if we have a class of 10, typically about three people would pursue a PhD program from us, um, and the other 70% would go into a variety of professional uh, endeavors, such as game design, TV production, management, museum education, not-for-profit work, advertising, marketing, um, really a, a wide range of areas. And if, uh, hopefully, uh, you are all aware that we have an alumni session tonight from 5 to 6.30. Uh, Shannon, what's that room? That is 56114. 56-114, which is actually a little easier to find than this one. Um, and we will have four uh, CMS alums there, two uh, who are who graduated a while ago, one from, I believe, 04, and maybe the other one 05 or 06, around there, and two who graduated just a few years ago. So. Um, and this is part of our colloquium series. I'll talk about uh, more about colloquium later, but it will give you a chance to get a sense of what CMS alums uh, do, what they're up to, and also ask them questions and, and that kind of thing. Um, we currently receive about 100 applications a year, um, and as I said, we admit somewhere between 8 and 10. Um, I told you it's a fully funded program and to the best of our ability, uh, mostly via these research lab sponsorships. Um, and uh, the program, uh, I'll, I'll walk you through the um, uh, course requirements and so on. Um, but basically, you take a range of courses for your first uh, year and a half, and you're spending your last semester, although it is starting before then, your preliminary research and so on. Uh, but you spend the end of the program, you're, you're culminating the program with the creation of a master's thesis, um, which is a written work of 70 to 100 or so pages. Sometimes it has a strong uh, digital component, an online component. We've had a student, for example, who has uh, written a thesis but also produced a documentary to go along with that thesis, or at least a rough cut. <laughs> um, so sometimes these projects get very ambitious. I've had people come to my office and say, well, I want to write a thesis but also do a website and, and a film. And Good luck with that, but let's focus on the thesis to start with. <laughs> so um, it, uh, you have to be careful not to bite off more than you can chew. Um, and uh, students uh, will get experience not, uh, it, through the program not only doing this kind of individual work, which is what a thesis is, uh, but also through various kinds of teamwork, um, whether that means working together in your lab, uh, working on publications together, um, giving group presentations, um, and some of the things that our three representative students could probably talk about a little bit in, in more detail um, in a few minutes. Um, here we go. So, uh, here are the four big trans elements of comparative media studies. We are transmedia, we are transhistorical, we are transcultural, and we are transdisciplinary. Um, here are photos of, which I'm not sure how well you can see, but of all of our faculty. 
So we've got um, Vivek Bald, who works on documentary production um, and uh, also um, has this very interesting uh, platform that he's developed for um, Indian immigrant communities to share their histories. It's, it's basically a kind of place where people find photographs of their families and put them up, and then people can say, oh, I knew that guy. You know, I worked with him in Brooklyn in 1952. And so he's building history in this kind of uh, uh, very managed, crowdsourced kind of way among his own uh, subjects of his history. Uh, Federico Casaleño is a professor of the practice who runs the Mobile Experience Lab, which I am told is soon to be rebranded as Design Lab. OK. Um, Ian Connery is an anthropologist who works uh, on uh, anime and, uh, in Japan and on pop music, Japanese pop music, um, and the economics of the global music industry. Sasha Kosanjachak works on uh, civic media issues, has written a book on transmedia uh, activism and immigrant communities uh, in the Los Angeles area, um, works on uh, a number of social justice issues. Fox Terrell runs the Imagination, Computation, and Expression Laboratory, and so he's interested in cognition issues and experimental uh, uh, computational uh, production that is organized around um, uh, intersectionality and identity issues. Heather Hindershot, that's me. I work on uh, conservative and right-wing uh, media culture. My most recent book was on William F. Buckley, who um, tried to get all the crazy, weird people out of the conservative movement and forge a more legitimate image for that movement. He briefly succeeded, but they, they come back like weeds. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Eric Klopfer works on uh, STEM and educational games and runs the uh, name of the lab, Shannon? Does he run at Arcade right now? Yes. Yes, at Arcade. Um, Nick Momford does uh, computational poetry. Uh, really, really interesting stuff and just a perfect example of the sort of merger of the human, humanities interest and technology interest at MIT because he's often working on uh, ways that computers uh, themselves can generate poetry. Um, but he uses, not just computers, he uses his, his brain too. He's been, for example, he's been working for a long time on a book, of, of, a book that would be composed of nothing but three letter words. Um, called, shoot, <laughs> I'll look it up, it's a great three letter word. <laughs> I was once trapped in a car trip with him and he just named three letter words. <laughs> it's very, very interesting stuff. Um, Lisa Parks works on uh, international issues around um, technology and surveillance and military technology. She's got uh, a, a new book out called Life in the Age of Drones. Um, she's been working on uh, very interesting cell phone apps uh, for use in Turkey and other countries where there's uh, quite a bit of censorship and helping people to use their cell phones when they're worried about surveillance, but they want to talk about things that are illegal, like uh, birth control issues or, or gay and lesbian rights issues and so on. She's uh, been working uh, in a team um, to develop that that would help people in censored kind of situations. Um, Jim Parody works on uh, surveillance. Um, and history of science. Uh, and Shiafa is our head, who will be stopping by later um, after a meeting. Do you know what time that meeting gets out, Shiafa? It depends on what's on the agenda. We'll so see. Unclear. He's got a big administrative meeting, so he will stop by. But he uh, is a, a rhetorician who also works on um, uh, contemporary media issues. He's got uh, some, he's done quite a bit of work on Michael Moore's films and uh, also work on um, transgender identity in media. It's work on uh, Transparent, I believe. Um, Justin Reich runs the Skeller Teacher Education Program. Oops. <laughs> and then, OK, wait, but he does work with Steph, right? Yeah. OK, and the well. Teaching Systems Lab. Um, uh, T.L. Taylor is a sociologist who focuses on esports. Um, uh, William Arricchio uh, does so many things, um, uh, historical work, contemporary work, and, dare I say, futuristic work. Um, he runs the Open Documentary Lab and is known particularly for his research on virtual reality. Um, and finally, Jing Wang, who works on, who has a, 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 an NGO called NGO, I believe? NGO 2.0. NGO 2.0 in China and works on media and advertising in China, and she can fill you in 
um, which she does in just a moment after I finish going through all these slides. Um, so that gives you a sense of our range. Um, and the interdisciplinarity of it. I mean, we have people who train in very conventional uh, humanities fields. I myself was an undergraduate double major in French and film studies, and I went to grad school to study feminist film theory, and then I became self-taught as a TV study scholar, um, and then I wrote a book about radio, and you know, so we, we come from an interesting range of backgrounds. Um, as I mentioned, we have these uh, research groups that uh, help us uh, sort of put our, our theory, our critical ideas into practice. They also provide, provide um, uh, funding opportunities for our students. So the, the Center for Civic Media, the Education Arcade, the Game Lab, uh, the Mobile Experience Lab, the Imagination Computation Expression Lab, Hyper Studio, Global Media Technologies and Cultures Lab, that's uh, Lisa Park's uh, new lab, that's our newest one, I believe. Um, Teaching Systems Lab, also new-ish. No, yes, no. Uh, open Documentary Lab that I just mentioned, uh, and uh, the Trope Tank, which is Nick Moth Works. And rap. What? Rap. And rap. Writing, rhetoric, and professional communication. Okay. Uh, and I'll just mention that if you are here and you are funded through a research lab, that would entail about 20 hours a week of, of work. And we do our best to align your interest with your lab, but that doesn't always work out, but we try. Um, uh, I've already mentioned who directs what labs, so I won't belabor this too much. Um, but the, some of them have a, a uh, professor who is doing the lead as a research director, and some of them have research directors like Open Doc Lab and Sarah Walden and so on. So you can get, look at all that on our website. Um, another part of our program is that we have visiting scholars and uh, postdocs. So for example, uh, Tanasi Coates was here for two years as the Martin Luther King Visiting Scholar, teaching uh, kind of more on the W side about um, uh, memoir, um, uh, and long form writing memoir. Uh, Teresa Rojas, who worked on comics and Latina and Latino identity. Uh, Kareem Ben Khalifa, who's an open doc lab artist, uh, kind of artist filmmaker in residence. So we, we usually have about 10 visitors in residence uh, ranging from a semester um, to a year or two. The Mellon postdocs are often here for uh, two years. Um, and it adds uh, kind of fresh blood kind of constantly coming into the program. Um, and some of these people also teach courses. And they're also just here as a resource. Um, you know, we don't, uh, Jim Parody, for example, teaches uh, a comics class, but comics has been slow to develop as part of our curriculum. But since we had Teresa Rojas, if you're interested in comics, you could search her at the time. Issues. So the, the visiting scholars help uh, sort of bring in new ideas and, and new stuff to what we're doing. Um, this is uh, this material is all on the website again. So I'll try to. Can you guys actually see this? Yes. Good. Okay. Um, so I'll run through the curriculum for you. In the first year, uh, you take media theories and methods one. Um, what a terrific title. Um, followed by media theories and methods two in the spring. So um, in the first course, you're surveying uh, a broad range of, of theories and methods in media studies, um, culminating typically with an annotated bibliography that relates to your thesis idea. And we really are looking for very directed people who come here with an idea about what they want their thesis to be on, although it shouldn't necessarily just sort of be solidified and concrete, if you, if you will. Um, you want to be flexible and open enough that you're taking classes that sort of open your mind to different possibilities. Um, but uh, because it is such a fast-paced program, um, uh, someone who had very, very squishy general ideas about, well, I don't know, my thesis will be on education in the future, <laughs> no, too general. So we like a more sort of specific focus so you can really hit the ground running um, with your studies and with looking forward to your thesis. So you would end Theories and Methods 1 with an annotated bibliography. Typically, that's the final assignment. Um, and then Theories and Methods 2 ends with a proposal for what your thesis will be on. That is like a, a whole like, uh, uh, seminar paper. Then you've got workshop one, which uh, varies depending on who is teaching it, but tends to have a strong uh, hands-on uh, component. Uh, major media text is a textual analysis class for thinking about the content of media. 
um, not just maybe as a technology, say. Um, and then Colloquium is a series I mentioned earlier that meets every Thursday that is part of your uh, coursework, except all you have to do is register for it and show up. It's great. You don't have to write papers. You don't have to prepare ahead of time. Uh, you might look up who the speaker is because he might be really interesting to you and you want to network with them and you want to we have a reception afterwards and you want to talk to them. Occasionally we are able to take people out to dinner together after colloquium. Um, so it's a great opportunity to just sit back and learn things. <laughs> and there's a lot of time for Q&A during those colloquiums too. So it's a nice uh, opportunity to learn new stuff but also just to uh, hang out with your community basically. Um, and uh, then in the second semester, I already mentioned the uh, Media Theories and Methods 2. Um, we just had a workshop too, and it never quite gelled the way we wanted. We kept changing what we were doing in that class, and we weren't we just trying to get the bullseye. And then we decided, aha, let's open it up. Let's give people more electives as a possibility. And so what we came up with was a list of managed electives that all had a kind of hands on component, some kind of production element to them, um, whether that meant uh, writing code or uh, designing uh, something, that's very general, designing <laughs> something. Um, and so we came up with a list of, Shannon, would you say it's about 15, a dozen? Uh, a dozen now. About a dozen yes. now. Um, we can always sort of add and subtract to that over time. Uh, we actually asked Nick Lomper to develop a new class in computational expression so that students would have a, a, a place built for graduate students to learn about computational work. Um, and then you have um, another, so that's, a, that's an elective but from a managed list, and then you have another open elective, um, which you could take here, but you could also take it at Harvard or Wellesley or MassArts, that doesn't happen too much, but people do tend to go up to Harvard and sometimes they take something, say the School of Education. Um, sometimes people um, experiment with classes here at, at Sloan, which has a um, uh, sort of a media element to it, but you know, with a very strong business orientation. And then you've got uh, colloquium once again. And then in your second year, uh, first semester, Media and Transition is a, a sort of transmedia historical class in media studies. You've got two electives and colloquium. The second semester, you've got your thesis and colloquium and an optional elective, which is probably more fighting on board than you can shoot. But sometimes people will just audit um, a class that would be useful for their thesis, for example, but that they don't want to take on extra assignments for. Um, the thesis. Give you a few examples. This is impossible to read from, from where you are, but maybe those watching the live stream had a better than it was. Um, so just a few examples. Uh, a thesis by uh, Chris Kerch recently uh, called Critical Breaking. Um, to allow for reflective and critical examination analysis of instances of error, breakdown, and failure in digital systems. Um, so it's looking at, like, for example, how gamers would like, work a system until it broke down and, how, and what happened there. Um, uh, Evan Higgins wrote a thesis called The Allure of Choice, Agency and World Building in Branching Path Transmedia Universes. Um, so that was a much more textual oriented analysis than some of the more uh, bigger technologically oriented outlooking analyses. Uh, Josh Powell's From Trump Tower to the White House in 140 Characters. Now 280, right? Way back then, it was 140. The hypermediated election of a paranoid populist president. That might be. Um, then we had Maya Wagner, Technology Against Technocracy Toward Design Strategies for Critical Communication Technology. And one last example, George Sibieratis. Everything is awful. Snark as ritualized social practice in online discourse. <laughs> so that gives you a nice uh, sense of the range. Um, a number of our alums have written books. Uh, this was a nice example of someone who actually wrote a book written on their thesis, Molly Sawyer, from 2013, who had written a thesis called Distributed Denial of Service Actions and the Challenge of Civil Disobedience on the Internet. Um, and she wrote this book called The Coming Swarm. And I, you know, she always liked to include a cheap, adorable picture of a cat in her PowerPoint presentation. And I always try to do that in homage to her, and I realized I forgot to do that today. Um, another uh, book by one of our graduates, uh, Aslan Kunatham, Kunatham Bekar, uh, who's Associate Professor of Communication at the University of Michigan right now, wrote a book from, called From Bombay to Bollywood, The Making of a Global Media Industry. Um, 
We've got uh, Candice Tallison from the class of 02, How Climate Change Comes to Matter, the Communal Life of Facts. Uh, Anita Say Chan from O2, Networking Peripheries, Technological Features and the Myth of Digital Universalism. Um, here's another one. Uh, actually, Kevin Driscoll recently came and spoke at our colloquium on Minitel, uh, class of 09, who has just co-authored a book on uh, Minitel, Welcome to the Internet, um, with another professor, Julian Allen. Um, Brian Jacobson wrote a film studies book, Studios Before the System, Architecture, Technology, and the Emergence of Cinematic Space. I'm almost done. Uh, <laughs> Whitney Tretien from 09, Gaff Stutter. I don't know what that is, but it's, it's a nice title. Um, there's a full list of our alum right on our website, so uh, you can get a sense of what they're doing now, what they've done since graduation. Um, so I won't, I won't go through all these names, I'll just read aloud this list at the bottom. We've seen careers in radio and podcast, as, as radio and podcast strategist. We've got a fellow at San Francisco Mayor's Office of Civic Innovation, manager of digital entertainment uh, at the Andy Warhol Museum, product manager for Apple Consumer Intelligence, uh, program manager at Etsy, so that gives you a sense of the range. I already told you about the weekly colloquium series, bring it home. Um, and of course, here is uh, our lovely website. So, that's my very quick run through. Um, I wonder, I'd like to open up for questions, but um, I would like to hear from a couple of people up here too. Um, I wonder if we could start with Jane because I know she has to cut out for a lunch meeting and maybe she could uh, introduce herself and talk a little more about the research. Sure, do you want me to? Yeah, come on up here. You can sit, you can stand up or just sit in that chair. All right, I'll stand up. Hi, how are you? Uh, Jane Wong, I'm a professor at CMS Nauru. Let me use one sentence to describe what I do. Uh, I'm interested in uh, studying uh, the impact of uh, new media on commercial communication, as in advertising. I'm also interested in the impact of social media on civic communication and civic, civic communities. Uh, on the commercial side of things, I um, um, one of the focuses of my work is on the changing fortunes of TV, digital, and social, and I look at them from the perspectives of branding and advertising uh, research. Now lately, I've been expanding my advertising research to the larger question of the changing media ecosystem in the US and in China, and I'm particularly drawn to um, to what I would call a phenomenon of vertical crossover vertical crossovers, meaning tech companies are branching into, uh, crossing over into the media sector, uh, competing with uh, traditional content makers and traditional content distributors. And I can give you three examples. Apple, we all know, Netflix in the US, and Alibaba in China. So uh, one of the burning questions in that area of research is how do we understand um, how do we understand the ways that digitalization is shaping or is uh, pushing boundary, uh, industry boundaries? How do we understand the world of sectors without borders? So that's the commercial side of my research. On the civic side of things, uh, I am a believer uh, about the importance of practicing what we write about. So as Heather mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, uh, apart from teaching and doing research uh, at MIT, I'm also running a nonprofit organization in China, practicing ICT-powered activism. So I have a foot in both worlds, the commercial and the civic, because Web 2.0 technology is enabling the crossover of the previously unconnected uh, worlds. Uh, for example, the, the market and the civic habitat. So this is a very quick. Um, First, I view of what I do, and Professor Heather also asked me to share the topics of some of the thesis that I advised and supervised in the past. So I'm going to just give you a quick list of uh, topics that uh, my uh, the previous CMS graduate students worked on. Okay, one of them is a case study of uh, electronic arts electronica uh, future lab. Uh, Ars Electronica is an Austrian cultural, educational, and, and scientific institute, very active in the area in the field of new media art. 
Okay, another thesis on the sixth generation of filmmakers in China and their relationship to documentary filmmaking. And uh, another thesis on advertising, electric signs in Manhattan, New York, between 1881 and 1917. Okay, and another one, a remake of Chinese animation. And then online BBS uh, sphere. BBS refers to the traditional internet forum system. And then a thesis on hidden activism, media practices and the media opportunity in the politics of resistance. Finally, uh, a thesis on makers, hackers, and geeks in China, creativity in the Chinese technology community. So I know it's too early for you to think about your thesis, but this <laughs> list hopefully will give you an idea about the broad range of uh, research uh, topics that the previous graduate students uh, worked on, uh, those whom I worked with. Alright, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I think it's helpful. It's helpful to hear a list of the, the theses that someone's advised. Just to give you a sense of the range, um, I'll just add that the, of the thesis list we just looked at, I advised the one on snark uh, and online discourse, and the one on uh, Twitter and, uh, and Trump. I also advised a project on digital literacy, uh, a, digital, a digital literacy project that was being undertaken in Brooklyn. Uh, with, uh, with and providing students with tablets. Um, and I also uh, advised a thesis on podcasting and its impact on TV uh, writers. Um, and this was shortly after the, the writer's strike, which was, a lot of that was around podcast issues and like, you know, you're gonna, who's gonna pay for this stuff? Who, you know, do we get residuals on podcasts? What is this meaning of the industry? Um, so that gives you a little bit of sense of the kind of thesis work. Um, could we maybe hear from uh, our two lab representatives who are here, like Kurt? Okay, and, yes. You could, talk about your, you could also talk about the classes that you teach. Yes, yes, yes. I definitely will. So welcome. Good morning. Uh, it's great to see that many of you here. So my name is Kurt Fent. I direct uh, Hyper Studio, which operates in an area that's called digital humanities. I also have a joint appointment with Global Studies and Languages, where I teach in uh, German studies, uh, film classes, and German culture classes. Uh, but HyperStudio is really concerned with the changes that the digital technologies uh, impact on, on uh, teaching, on learning, on research, and on the creation, the design in, in the humanities. So we have a number of projects, but we also uh, develop technology we do research uh, in this field, and we also do uh, research in the public sphere. So we work what's called uh, public humanities, meaning, for example, we work with museums, we work with public archives, uh, and so on. So it's really um, a very multifaceted approach to rethinking what these digital technologies mean you know, for uh, the humanities. Uh, so, for example, we also uh, work with um, faculty here at MIT, but also with outside partners. One of the projects, for example, uh, deals with the diplomatic history between the U.S. and Iran. Uh, so this is focusing on uh, the miscommunication between the two countries, and as you can imagine, you know, this is a highly political uh, topic. So we look at uh, declassified documents, uh, that uh, have been produced on both sides and work with scholars uh, in the field to basically rethink where things did go wrong. So we build the tools for that, we uh, ex uh, exchange ideas and, and work with the scholars uh, in the field to really come up with a new way of thinking what do these uh, tools and technologies and, and archives actually mean in, in that space. And that's also connected to a new initiative that we started a couple of years ago, which we call the Active Archives Initiative. And that's really about rethinking uh, what digital archives mean uh, nowadays. So it's, it's a focus that we have, it's primarily on the end user. So what do end users really try to get out of, of an archive? So it's not so much focusing on the content that's in the archive, not focusing on the ways the archive gets produced and digitized, 
but it's really how do people work with archives. Uh, and this is a focus that we're trying to do also in, in multiple spaces, in the educational space, in the research space, and also in the public space. Um, and for that, we also develop technologies. Uh, so we look at, for example, how can uh, people create new layers of meaning, how they can they create knowledge that's layered on top of the original uh, 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 archival material. So it has to do with story creation, it has to do with making connections and adding new content to those materials. So one of, one of the students in the lab, um, he works on employing natural language processing and machine learning to uh, think about how, on the one hand, the, um, the archival material can be analyzed, but on the other hand, also how the cont contributions by the users, for example, through annotation or through new stories, can actually be combined and leveraged so that when you have thousands of users, you know, they can still find uh, aspects that are relevant for your own research. So it's going into that direction of rethinking, combining basically what we have done uh, in, in HyperStudio in terms of uh, projects, and we've done them for a long time, so we're one of the oldest uh, research groups. Um, and uh, besides having uh, graduate students, you know, like uh, Rachel uh, Thompson, uh, who will be talking, I guess, about the, the, what, what you work is, sure. mm -hmm. yeah, in, in HyperStudio as well. Um, so we also teach classes, uh, so there's a, a class on visual humanities, uh, topics, techniques, and technologies, uh, and that's really uh, looking into how the computational approach uh, is focusing you know, on a critical aspect of how we need to look at data uh, in the humanities and how we need to critically look at representations, visual representations in, in that class. Uh, we're also developing a, a new class that's uh, focusing a little more on archives, data archives, uh, and interfaces. Uh, and we, for that, we also collaborate with, with other teams in, in, in Germany and, and uh, Switzerland. Uh, so there's also an international idea where students get involved in this research project. But these are all topic, uh, not topics-based, uh, also they have topics, but they're project-based classes. So students develop projects in a collaborative fashion, uh, and so on. So it's, it's also a really multifaceted program. Uh, and so there are constantly new projects coming on board, uh, depending on the collaborations, and sometimes, admittedly, depending on the funding uh, that we receive, because that's always a, a big issue. Uh, but it's a really interesting um, uh, area of, of research and practice that HyperStudio is, is involved in. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Um, I'm going to pause for just one minute and suggest to you that if at any moment you need a cookie or a cup of coffee, just get up and go for it. <laughs> Don't be shy. That's there for you. Um, also, I remember the name of Nick Montfort's three words only book in progress. <laughs> one for the win. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so next we'll hear from YJ Kim. Hi, my name is Waiziki. I'm a research scientist at Kitchen Systems Lab. Uh, that's a lab directed by uh, Justin Wright. Uh, I'm kind of representing a group of people within MIT campus who cares about um, learning uh, and teaching. Uh, how many of you guys are interested in education? Awesome. So um, there are two labs that uh, exist, and uh, I, I work at Kitchen Systems Lab, and our mission is uh, we in investigate the complex technology-rich classrooms of the future and the systems we need to help educators thrive in those settings. So we face a lot of uh, our primary audience are teachers and educators. Um, there are three lines of work that we're doing within our lab. Um, we do online teacher education, so we launch two uh, MOOCs. Uh, one is about uh, using system thinking tools to uh, bring innovations within your schools. Uh, and the other is about design thinking, how teachers can uh, use design thinking tools in their own classrooms, and more kind of case studies of uh, those teachers who are already doing that. So those are two kind of online courses we launched this year. Uh, again, helping teachers to bring different kind of practices in the classroom. Um, another line of work we do a lot is called practice spaces. Uh, within, uh, at a lot of graduate schools, uh, there is kind of this divide between 
uh, seminarums and clinicals. So in terms of teacher education, uh, pre-service teachers go to these classes and learn about these theories of learning and teaching, um, a, a lot of theories. And then without having kind of concrete practice, uh, in between space they go to clinicals where they actually start teaching. Uh, so what we're doing is using games and simulations uh, to prepare the kind of more playful, uh, authentic uh, practice spaces for uh, teachers and pre-service teachers. So I brought two kind of games as an example here, so you can talk about it later. Uh, we create both non-digital and digital, non-digital and digital games for teachers. Um, so for example, this game called Meta Rubric, it's a game about assessment. Uh, I'm coming from assessment design background, and most people think assessment is super boring, and I disagree. Uh, so we create this game so teachers can actually learn about authentic assessment design principles in a playful manner. So this kind of exemplify kind of things we're doing. Uh, the last line that we're doing is uh, playful assessment. Um, that's a kind of collaboration between teaching systems lab and uh, education arcade lab, uh, where we're creating uh, game-based assessment um, and um, training like this for teachers where can, they can learn about assessment. And also thinking about uh, assessment in uh, spaces like maker spaces, where there's obviously a lot of rich data that are generating, uh, there's not much assessment because a lot of make, makers don't believe that uh, baking can be assessed, and how we are envisioning um, what assessment can look like in that kind of context. So those are kind of one of the work that we're doing at Teaching Places Lab. Uh, an education arcade uh, directed by uh, Eric Crawford's lab, and more uh, K-12 student-facing work. So like STEM learning, uh, VR uh, games, that where you can learn about STEM, uh, STEM cells and things like that, um, and like math games and things so these are kind of two groups within MIT who are doing uh, using technology for education purposes. Thank you. Um, okay. uh, now I have another place where game design is going on is of course in Game Lab. And unfortunately, we don't have the room for the Game Lab here today. Oh. Wait, I mean, I meant, I meant, I meant, I meant, I meant it's like why I'm here. I meant research manager. <laughs> we're going to hear all about Game Lab. Okay. <laughs> Um, but that's another place where you yeah. get game designs going on, and on their website you can get a sense of the games they've made in the past. I'll just segue right into Claudia Lowe, telling you about Game Lab. But you can also, she's one of our students, yeah. you can also talk about some of her experiences here. So I'll, I'll do the student part first. Okay, uh, great. So Thank hi, you. I'm Claudia Lowe. I'm a second year student at CMS. Uh, I'm also an international student, so if any of you are non-US citizens, I can talk a little bit about that experience. Um, but yeah, I'm primarily here today because how dare they, all of the lab managers of the game lab are doing their jobs and teaching. So uh, uh, I'm up here to tell you about the game lab. Right. Yeah. How? <laughs> um, so uh, at the game lab, we kind of, we make games and then we play games and we study them and we sort of specialize in the advantages that kind of can bring to the table when it comes to researching and teaching. Uh, so for example, we have very close ties to that arcade. Um, and I think also to ICE, that's the Imagination, Creativity, and Expression Lab that's headed up by Fox Rell. Um, so, you know, we do games, but we're not the only lab that does games uh, here at CMS. Um, so, for example, two of the projects that I've participated in in our lab is uh, we have one long term topic on looking at how Player 2 gets designed in games. Uh, and this started off looking purely at video games, but also has expanded to incorporate board games. So we don't like discriminate between, you know, board games versus uh, traditional games versus uh, video games. They're all we kind of count all of them as under our purview. Uh, another project that I'm on right now is looking at uh, representations of colonialism in board games, uh, uh, specifically representational aspects. Not in like the game art, not just in sort of the, the kind of the fantasy or the concept behind the board game, but like actually in sort of what are the little pieces? What do they look like? How do you move them? That more that kind of a thing. Um, my own research right now, so I'm neck deep in thesis territory right now. Uh, and my thesis is looking at the social and communicative work that online volunteer moderators do. So, you know, these are the people who, who kind of like spend all day removing the like bad comments on websites uh, and sort of looking up what they're doing outside of just removing things or those things of comments or like people uh, and, and like abandoning them from the site way, not anything more sinister. Um, my lab mate, uh, Kaylin Bill uh her thesis is on 
affect emotion and intimacy in games and how you know we achieve those senses of intimacy while we play uh, and seeing if there are mechanics in games uh, that encourage that sort of uh, emotional affective response. Yeah. So that is the short version. I will say that uh, the caveat to like game lab, you think, you know, this means game design all the time. Actually, uh, a lot of us don't have a background in CS or in code. Uh, while it's certainly an option that tends to come out of classes or even thesis work, um, but support for kind of coming up with tools or finding tools generally comes through the lab uh, and comes through sort of my research assistantship and working with it. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, let's hear from two more students before we open up for Q&A. You want to go? Ashka. Okay, I can go. Hi everybody, my name is Ashka Deve. Like Claudia, I am a second year CMS student, which means I am also neck deep in thesis work. I also have a tendency to talk softly, so please yeah, tell me to say. speak up if Louder. necessary. <laughs> it's, it's really hard, I'm working on it. <laughs> um, I am the research assistant for RAP, which as Heather mentioned, is MIT's writing rhetoric and professional communication program. RAP fits a unique space within the MIT community because in addition to being a part of CMS, they oversee the communication intensive courses for the MIT undergrads. So this means that they have a number of instructors who go into courses specific to engineering or into more humanities oriented courses to talk specifically about communication to provide instruction in those practices and to help students become better communicators. And this means that a large part of their research focus is also on how can we help students communicate better. So at present, the research project we're working on is focusing on mapping out critical processes of thinking in different fields. Those fields at present include fields like material science and engineering, brain and cognitive science, comparative media studies, in order to create maps or outlines that students can then use as they try to write papers or work on their first writing projects as undergrads to help people who might be too in the weeds in their own field as beginning learners and researchers figure out how to take things forward and communicate their work effectively. So in a nutshell, that's what we're working on. Um, as a part of CMS, my thesis is looking at how practices of audience engagement have become inculcated in news organizations. So what does it mean if someone's a social media editor or someone's working on audience engagement? And how does that play into sensationalism, especially when society thinks that they might be at risk in certain situations for a given disease? Um, feel free to ask more questions about that later if you would like to. And let's see if there's anything else. Um, my background's in journalism, so if you have specific questions about going from journalism to something that's not journalism, feel free to ask about that as well. Also, the lecture polls. Oh yes, that's a very good point. All right, so I am currently the chair of the halls at Sydney Pacific, which is one of the graduate residence communities on the MIT campus. As chair of the halls, I'm in charge of the hall counselors and the general well-being of somewhere between six and 700 residents in SIDPAC. And if you have any questions specific to the well-being of students on campus, specific to how graduate housing works for students, specific to just like the general community life on campus at MIT, I am also a very good person to ask about those. Thank you. And finally, hi everybody, my name is Rachel Thompson and I'm a first year CMS student, so I'm only like ankle deep in thesis. I'm not <laughs> yet. I love this sort of quicksand kind of feeling. We're going to be in quicksand. Um, <laughs> So I don't have much, too much to say on that. I'm a research assistant in HyperStudio, which as Kurt explained, is the digital humanities lab at MIT. Uh, I have a couple of like, different projects that I work on in the lab. I make a weekly newsletter that gathers digital humanities news um, across like basically the internet. Um, and so you should sign up for that. It's very informative uh, and very useful. Uh, I also am a teaching assistant for his digital humanities class. So I you know, go to the class and like help lead discussion and kind of present on things. I have a background in um, art museums and art. Uh, I worked at the Harvard Art Museums and I worked at the Peabody Essex Museum up in Salem in their like media departments. So I've also specifically, Kurt has a uh, project called ArtBot and uh, I could talk to you a little bit more about that, but it's on the back burner right now, but you know, we're hoping to get it back up. 
Uh, I work on another project, which is Annotation Studio, which falls under the Active Archives Initiative. Uh, it's a tool that is uh, an online tool for uh, collaborative annotation, especially in pedagogical situations, so like in the classroom. So classes can all look at the same text, all annotate it, and everyone can kind of sh see and share each other's annotations as kind of a springboard for talking and class discussion or like understanding text. Um, and at the same time, we're hoping to develop a new tool, which is um, Idea Space, which is to create, um, help you outline essays from the annotations that you would make in Annotation Studio. So you can kind of see where we're going from reading and writing and better understanding close reading to better understanding the writing process. So we're currently working on, I'm helping work on an NEH proposal for that right now. Otherwise, I can't tell you much about theses. I'm interested in representations of incarceration across media, but that's about as far as I've gotten. Great, right. thank you. All right, um, yes. Please, I would like to say a few words about the design lab. Um, you have to take over? Sure, yeah. great. I came in late, so I was sitting in the back. <laughs> Hi everyone, so uh, my name is Lian. I am from the Mobile Experience Lab, Design Lab. I'm a co-director there with Professor Casaleño, uh, Frederico Casaleño. He's also teaching, of course, in Design and Interaction. Um, at our lab, uh, we're a very multidisciplinary lab. We actually we have students from all five schools within MIT, from architecture to engineering to humanities, from CMS students as well. And we work, um, our focus is on applying human-centered design, experience design, um, through with industry partners. So we work, um, all of our um, lab projects are sponsored, and we work with cost industries from food and nutrition to uh, connected devices and lighting. So currently we have one CMS student working with us um, in our connected lighting project for Phyllis Design, in um, seeing how we can situate technology of lighting devices, connectivity, um, IoT, and all of those with, um, for the future of the um, parent city. Another project that we've done in the past, which we had multiple CMS students in, was our Caring Cities project, so which was a very economically focused project where we had students, um, not just within CMS, but also from different, different departments, going and doing research on you know, projecting the future trends and to understand where we should go as a study towards um, what kind of experiences and services and products we should provide within the Caring City context and framework. So, we, um, yeah, we're, we're currently about, about 15 to 20 people, um, from graduate students to undergraduate students to full research staff. So this could be another lab that you can also take in if you join me. Right, thank you. Did I miss anyone else? I don't think so. Okay, then we are open for Q&A. Um, there's no uh, sort of standardized system in place for, you know, here's, here's how you're going to publish a piece by the end of your first or second year, that we, we don't work that way. Um, I was thinking in particular of, of the fact that some professors collaborate with students, like Lisa Parks has collaborated with her graduate students. Uh, in fact, she co-edited a book with one of her students at UCSD at Santa Barbara before she came here. Um, other students work together uh, uh, to give conference presentations. Um, Kaylin is, has a piece forthcoming, I believe. Kaylin has a piece forthcoming on, on Hannibal. Hannibal. Mm -hmm. I have, no, I just published one in mm -hmm. uh, September about sort of queer temporality in games. Mm -hmm. And the both of us, uh, so our, uh, the player shoot research we did, um, sort of part of that we wrote up as a paper. Um, and both Kayla and I, Kayla's my lab mate, both of us got co-authorship credit mm -hmm. on that with our lab directors, so we published that last January. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are opportunities. Yeah, Do you, I don't know if you guys have any experiences mm -hmm. to add to that. Yeah. It, I think it depends a bit. Uh, if you're looking to publish through your lab or your research assistant work, I think it depends a little bit at like what stage of the research that lab is in. So if it's very preliminary, you know, that's kind of if they're still gathering data, then that's where it's going to be. But, uh, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to kind of help get those to a stage where they're ready to be published. So, yeah. 
And um, it's just helpful to remember that your 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 professor, your faculty, uh, your fa the faculty are here as, as kind of mentors to you. So if you write a paper for them, and they're like, aha, this is publishable. Let's revise it. You know, they'll work with you. Um, or if you come to them and say, I actually would like to publish because I want to go to graduate school in a year or two. Um, you know, you can work collaboratively to, to kind of up your credentials in that. Yeah, and we've done that in, in Harper Studio as well, so the, involving the, the RAs in, in publishing the work that, that has come out of the lab. Uh, so museums on the web and, and some other uh, uh, outlets, we've yeah. done that. Uh, including also writing proposals for conferences, for example, then also for conference yes. proceedings and so on. So it's always a collaborative work that yeah. we do. Yeah, some, some uh, you know, most of these labs have some kind of deliverable, which might mean a white paper that they need you to collaborate on. Uh, in the case of Open Doc Lab, um, students will uh, quite often go to Sundance uh, and they, uh, the film festival, and they will blog about that. So there might be kinds of informal writing, such as blogging, compared to more formal published work. That's a good question. I have a question from the interwebs. Yes, let's hear from the wider world. Uh, what do you look for most in statement of objectives? Previous achievement, research experience, personal story related to this era, or anything? Uh, that's a good question. Um, personal stories are, are nice because they give you a sense of what the person is like, but, you know, it, I, I will say a long story about, like, uh, here's how I came to love Dungeons and Dragons. We, we've seen those a million times. <laughs> the, the long personal story about why you love games, it, it's a nice opener. But don't go off in too much in that direction. We really want to hear about what your interests are, your objectives, and you know the kinds of experiences that you would bring to the program that would be unique, um, that would benefit us and you. Um, we do sometimes take people right out of college. That happens, but usually, yay. <laughs> um, but quite often, it's someone who's been out for a year or two, or maybe a little bit more, um, because we like that level of, of life experience and work experience. And um, I would say also sometimes people might have undergraduate training in something that is not, that has applicability to what we do, but they don't have a super background, but then they go out and they make documentary film for two years, or they work for an interesting not-for-profit, and it increases their credentials in that area and sort of, sort of makes them into a media studies student in a way that they might not have been right out of, out of undergrad. So... Um, any of the specific kind of uh, intellectual and work-related experiences that, that help convey who you are and what your interests are would be helpful in your statement of objectives. Um, also, of course, you submit a writing sample, which should be uh, a scholarly work of some substance, and that conveys uh, your interests, but it also conveys you know, your basic writing skills and your approach to writing and so on. So you know, occasionally someone will um, We'll get in his writing sample was not really about media at all, but they they clearly had the chops for the program. They had the background, they had the, the, the grades, the, you know, this and that. Um, but what they had available as a writing sample might have been an undergraduate art, art history paper that wasn't directly relevant to us, but it showed um, creativity and thoughtfulness and an ability to, to do a deep kind of research. So um, uh, there is some kind of flexibility I'm done. Okay. Um, so just bouncing off of that, um, is I'm a little bit more mid-career right now. I've been working in ten year, for ten years, the last ten years in nonprofit communications, primarily with feminist and women's rights and human rights organizations, uh, producing all kinds of content. And I was, I've been, you know, interested about your program for a while now. And I thought, okay, let me come to this open house and see. Um, I was curious if, if, in terms of writing, I, I mean, what I'm looking for is really to get like some kind of a. I feel like we all are struggling with this information saturation, uh, and how do we? And I was really fascinated by some of the projects that came out of the program. Um, so I was really curious about: um, is this a place for somebody who's trying, who's been writing for a while, but wants to do something out of the box? With the skills and also some of the technical skills that the training that, that this program offers. So just, just yes. <laughs> yeah, what you okay, describe so sounds like something that would certainly be of interest to us. Yeah. Um, what kind of writing have you done? All kinds, like writing speeches for my director yeah. to producing podcast scripts, you know. So yeah. I've done a range of writing, but I also know that I think to be writing for new audiences, it's not the same 
And I feel like even from when I started my career to now, I think so much has changed, right? Mm -hmm. We're fighting attention spans, we're fighting so much. Mm -hmm. So I think the struggle has become different in the arena of writing. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I, that's why I was curious, like I, I, I'm a radio producer at heart, but now the world of podcast is like, you know, you're competing with so much. Mm -hmm. But there is also a lot of good content out there. There's a way to kind of navigate that. And, yeah. So I want to be building something. I've, I've been struggling the last couple of years with building something that I feel like, okay, this is something that is not adding to the noise. Mm -hmm. So I think, and, and I thought this program might be like a space to kind of reflect and build something. Yeah. Um, that just points to a really interesting sort of non-traditional background for an applicant. We definitely do get applicants from people who are or mid-career um, pretty often. Um, and so I would encourage you to apply. Um, I'll add that sometimes the people have been uh, uh, away from school for a long time. They don't have a writing sample on hand that makes sense to them. They're like, what's that, that five-page paper on hand with it? I did two, three years ago. This isn't really going to do it. And sometimes people will write something from scratch specifically for the application, just like uh, the nature of contemporary podcasting, you know, something that's up their alley, but they uh, write a research paper on that topic specifically for the application. Um, I have a question regarding um, the English uh, English proficiency requirement. Um, that, um, specifically about the waiver uh, for international students who, who receive or will be received um, a bachelor's degree from a English speaking university. Uh, yeah, that's what I did. I went to, I did my undergraduate degree in America also, and so my degree was issued from an you know, entirely English speaking uh, university. It was not a problem at all. Um, is it the same for those who will be grad, uh, who will not, who is not graduate, but will be graduated by the time um, enroll into the program? Yes. If you have or will have by the time you matriculate a degree from an English speaking university, you can waive the IELTS requirement for the application. It must be verifiable by transcript. So when you upload your transcript, it needs to be in English, and I need to be able to, um, by a very quick search, uh, verify that your course was taught in English. Thank you. That's very specific and helpful. <laughs> Uh, do graduates tend to stay in one lab for both years, or do they kind of switch around? Yes, yeah, they, 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 they do tend to stay in the same lab. There's a very rare occasional thing where someone will switch out for various reasons, but we really like to keep people in that same lab for the two years. And to expand on that, do you state in your statement of objectives which lab you would like to work on, or do you choose when you come in? Um, there is a space, and, and we might... Uh, I'll talk to Shannon about this later, but we might tweak this a little bit, how people indicate their, their lab interests in the application. Because what we find is if we say, you know, would you be able to, you know, what lab would you be interested in, people tend to list like eight or nine labs. You know, they list all the labs. Yeah. Because they're all very interesting. And, and, um, and so, uh, although it's fine to express an interest, um, we're typically looking at your qualifications to see where you might be the best fit. And then, by the time we get to the semi-finalist stage, um, we have this, we have a, I don't give you too many details, but we have, we have typically five groups of two, of two professors who are, or research managers, or a range of people who are examining everything um, and making the cut from 100 to 80 to 60, you know, so that by our final meeting we're at like 35 or so. Um, uh, by the time we're at the semi-finalist stage, we like to show all the applications to the uh, PIs and the lab managers so that they can uh, red flag anyone that they're like, yeah, that person looks like a good match for me. And so it's a mix of you know, your stated preference, but also what we see looking at your qualifications. Yeah. So um, it's not the most pressing part of your application to click off, I would like to be in these five labs. Everything else, I think, it's fair to say, is more important. Um, how often do students go for a PhD after finishing their master's program? I would say about 30% of the time. Typically, if we have a class of 10, about three of them will go out for a PhD program. And uh, pretty often right out of the master's program, uh, especially if there's someone who you know, took three or four years off between undergrad and coming here or even more time, they want to just keep the momentum going and go on to the next stage. And do they continue here or somewhere else? Occasionally, yes. We will have students go into... Um, 
which uh, which program is Eric Staten in? STS. STS Science and Technology Studies. Um, I don't think we've had students go right to the Media Lab yeah. in the future. Yeah. We have. Okay. Oh, right. Yeah, of course. So the Media Lab. Um, can you think of other graduate programs Gus. here? Gus. 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 Lily. Urban Studies. Design and Urban Studies. Department of Urban Studies and Planning. Planning. Thank you. Um, so we have a range of people who do, who do stay at MIT. Um, but uh, that's, I wouldn't say every year somebody stays at MIT among the, say, three or so who go on to graduate studies. We have people applying for a lot of uh, programs in California in particular, a couple in New York. Harvard. Uh, Harvard. Yeah, that happens too. Close. Yeah, <laughs> close. <laughs> you don't have to move. Um, uh, so it, it, is, uh, it is a mix. I would say maybe half the kind of go West Coast. Okay. Just because there's some great programs. Um, we have someone at uh, Chris Carriage who did the critical breaking in Santa Cruz right now. Is that correct? I think so. All right. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, so um, it, people go all over the place. Um, sort of back on the writing thing. Um, what difficulties would there be coming from a non so academic background? Like I went to school for animation and now I'm in comics, so I don't really have a whole lot of like academic experience mm -hmm. the same way that like anybody that went to a normal liberal arts school would? Um, it's hard to, uh, I mean it really depends on you know, kind of what your whole portfolio of experiences looks like. Um, you know, if, if, if someone uh, conveys that they are articulate and can use language nicely, you know, in their, in their statement of objectives, they have a solid writing sample, then uh, the fact that they have not come from a conventional academic background for the past five or ten years is fine. In fact, it's a plus because you bring the sort of life skills that someone else, you know, wouldn't. Um, and so um, uh, I'll just keep it there, <laughs> open ended. Yeah. Could you talk more about um, if you're looking any, for anything specific in the portfolio section and how kind of unconventional those? Yeah. Portfolio is kind of value added. You know, it's 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 if you put things in your portfolio, we will look at them, but it will often be the last thing we look at because we're looking at the basics first, like okay, GRE scores and the writing and the transcript and this and that. Um, but then the portfolio is nice because if you say that you're a game designer and, and you write a paper about this amazing game you created and you link it up, well, we're, we're going to take a look. You know, um, some people put up art. Um, so if you were in comics, it would make sense to put your comics work on, under the portfolio so you can see what you've been doing. Um, and so it's a very helpful supplement to, and, and especially for someone from a less conventional background, it's more than a supplement. Right? It'll, it'll help you know, pull you up potentially. Um, that said, if you don't have something for your portfolio, that is okay too. Not everyone is going to have a variety of you know, creative material that they want to share out in the portfolio with you. It's useful. I'm kind of curious about the thesis for the students, but I'm curious about the evolution of your thesis. <laughs> um, I'm curious to know what you, and you mentioned that, you know, people usually have a strong sense of what they want to pursue, so I'm curious if that's what you stuck with, what kind of ideas you want to pursue before, what, you know, now you're connecting, how did you get there? Do you want me to go first, or should I go? You can go first. Okay. So, um, when I applied here, my undergraduate background was uh, in film and media and gender studies, but I was also sort of a self-taught games uh, studies. And so when I came here, you know, statement of objectives, et cetera, like emphasized sort of my work in queer game studies. And when I got here, and then a week in, I was like, I'm not writing about that. <laughs> I'm 180. Uh, I'm going to write about uh, moderators because I'm also a moderator online. And I've done it for a long, a long time. And I was like, actually, I want to write about this now. I've, I've since sort of compromised. Because the mods that I'm looking at are working in sort of a, it, are working in esports related areas, so it's like nicely matched and bridged those two, and uh, I will say I settled on that topic after a week and kind of have stuck with it through till now. So I settled pretty early. Well, this is not the case for everyone. Um, I think a lot of us had like an idea and now we're done. I would say that mine came in a similar vein. It was definitely more of a funnel process. I started kind of broad with the fact that I had these seemingly disparate interests in like 
social media and how news organizations work and also public health. And then I think the question that I asked myself over the first year of the program was, how can I mix these together into something that I would find interesting and exciting that I would want to work on for another year, right? And over the course of asking myself that question repeatedly, particularly given that in our theories and methods courses, our professors make us poke and prod at what we're interested in over the course of the assignments, it narrowed down into something that was like an actual question that I was excited about looking at and answering and thinking about in more detail. You want to give it a shot even though you're only ankle deep? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I have a background in, I wrote my undergraduate thesis in, on a digital literary magazine. So I'm like shifting basically 180 now and like looking at incarceration. And I did practice in prison reform and prison advocacy. So that's kind of why I'm now looking at incarceration. But I came in originally, I'm, I was interested in education, specifically in um, situations of incarceration. However, um, there are like very strict standards about um, doing research in prisons and doing research with youth, and so prisons and youth is like the worst combination that you could have. Uh, so now I'm kind of in lieu of that, I'm circling by looking at like the politics of representation and crime media uh, rather. Now I just want to pause for a second because Vicky Zimmer is one of our grad students who just came in. Hi. Vicky, would you, do you want to join us up here? Sure. And would you mind uh, give, give me a little intro of yourself and maybe talking a bit about your thesis and your lab assignment? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. But uh, I'm Vicki. I'm a second year in CMS. I'm working with Lisa Parks in uh, Global Media Technologies and Cultures Lab. My own thesis is on how the fine dining industry is wrestling with the ever-changing nature of digital media and communication. So for example, like how does food porn and Instagram influence or is it considered by like three Michelin star chefs? Um, and sort of like taking like a historical look at how fine dining's wrestled with technology change and then also looking at today with what they're doing with it. And um, within my lab, it's a little different than my own research interests, but I actually really enjoy that because I think it's kind of nice to have some separation. <laughs> um, and it's also showing me a lot of areas within communication and media technology that I never would have explored myself. So I'm really appreciating getting a totally new perspective. And Professor Parks is fantastic. So I'm really happy with that. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yes, I have a question from the introverts. Yes. Uh, are the GRE scores weighed as more, equally, or less important than the statement of objectives slash writing sample slash GPA slash work experience? Um, I think it varies from application to application how uh, relevant GRE scores. If, if we see a pattern of someone who is uh, not a very strong writer in their statement of purpose in their writing sample and they had low GRE scores, okay, they're out. <laughs> Uh, if someone has exceptionally strong writing skills and yet they had a low verbal skill, we realize, well, maybe you're not very good at taking standardized tests. That happens, you know. Or uh, someone might have much higher uh, verbal skills than, you know, their, their math skills. You know, we, we are not as concerned about math as we are about uh, self-expression and, and using your verbal skills. So it varies from uh, application to application. Um, is it overall really good to have the highest GRE scores if you can? Yes, certainly. Um, uh, but that said, I do recognize that, that, that and we all recognize that some people are not terrific in standardized testing um, situations. Yeah. Um, another question is specifically target um, international students. Um, I know this is a program that will. Um, award the Master of Science uh, degree, and I wonder does that uh, degree, uh, or does that does this program count as a STEM program? No. no. <laughs> okay. Sorry. All right then. <laughs> <laughs> I wish for OT, but... Uh, this is a question more for the students. Uh, I was wondering how, on your thoughts about how this program has Help you 
I, I've been talking a lot. I don't want to start. Uh, uh, I and actually this is one of the things that I'm grateful to my teacher's advisor for because she um, encouraged me to be thinking about okay, once you write your thesis, who do you want to show it to? And has been helping me to kind of connect with academics, but also people in the industry that I'm looking at. Uh, and you know, sometimes they're formal, sometimes they're informal. Uh, again, if you are, if you have the chance to publish uh, with your lab, that can be great, especially if you're going to present it at a conference. Mm -hmm. um, so you, know, you can get funding through I mean, you can get funding through the program, also to just independently go to conferences on your own, and those are always really great places to meet people in your field. Um, the colloquiums are another good example, I think. Um, so every week, you know, the, the program will invite speakers over, and that's like a great opportunity to talk to people, or you can even suggest. Uh, people that the, the program should kind of bring and bring to, to talk to CMS. Uh, so that's always a, a nice opportunity as well. But I mean, also just MIT campus, there's just a lot of people who get invited here to speak here, and you can just go and show up. Yeah. yeah. And like to add on that, I think coming from MIT, it really helps you get your door in. The fo your foot in the door. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just woke up like an hour ago. Uh, um, and that, for example, like just emailing people that are visiting Harvard or visiting MIT and being like, I'm also a grad student at MIT. They'll usually respond to you. It's been pretty nice. Um, but also, like, I think you have to take the initiative saying, like, OK, I want to meet these kind of people. And once you take that initiative, there are people that will help you. Like, I always go to Shannon and be like, Shannon. Do you know anybody who does this? <laughs> and and she's like, oh, I know all these people. Like, let me look them up. Or Andrew, or with your professors. But nobody's nobody's going to be like, okay, you need to learn how to network, and I want you to meet X, Y, Z. You sort of have to say like, I would like to meet these people in this field. Do you know anyone? And then it's easy from there. I'd echo what Vicky said about that. I think oftentimes when I think of networking, it's more like who would I be very interested in talking to or asking questions? And then if I have that level of interest, then I'm like, okay, let me just send them an email or find someone who knows their email and then just do it that way. Or maybe they're giving a talk because there's lots of people giving talks at MIT and Harvard. And I'll just go say hi. I think I'm also the sort of person who, if I see an event that says networking in big letters, I will not go to it. <laughs> it's just not happening. So, um, in that sense, I'm actually kind of appreciative that CMS does not say, go to this networking event. For me, that would be just like a very insubstantive, insubstantive waste of time. Like, I just, it, I do not enjoy those. So, but they, exist, that's they exist. You can go to them if you want to, but I personally have avoided all of those with great success, and I think I've still been pretty good at networking just because there are lots of really cool people here doing very cool things and if you get in touch and you're like hi I want to talk to you because your stuff is cool then they're usually like yeah I'd love to do that people enjoy talking about themselves <laughs> yeah and also like CMS is really a department where if you want to do something and you take the initiative like you could pretty much do what you want. So like, if I decided, OK, we don't have a networking event for alums or people in this, but if I was like, hey, Heather and Shannon, like, can we have like a little coffee thing for CMS alums in Boston? I'm, I'm more than 100% sure, and Andrew too, that they would help me figure out how to make that happen. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's kind of like, what's the program you want it to be, and how can you help make it that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if networking means like meet interesting people, I like, could pretty built in to the program. But not like business school where you have like once a week these events well, where you have to go and talk yeah. with a name tag. Yeah. Yeah. Meet industry leaders. Yes. Thought leaders. LinkedIn influencers. Yeah. Yeah. Andrew? Can I pretend to be a perspective? Yes. Um, <laughs> so related to all that stuff, what are the opportunities for students to work with faculty that are not in CMS? Mm. Um, the students can speak to that. I will say that you have elective opportunities, the managed list and all the open electives, and that is how you might work with someone, say, in the media lab, or you might go up to the Berkman Center, the Berkman Center for Internet Studies, is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. Internet Law. Internet Law and Society, mm -hmm. perhaps. Um, uh, so uh, it is uh, a prior question of initiative, you know, going to the Berkman to hear talks, or going to talks at Harvard, or the Shorenstein Center for Media and Politics, or talks here, 
or through the classes that you take as electives? Yes. Or, or even not necessarily working with faculty. So again, my Latin, I think just released her first game, and that was off working with classmates, um, yeah. actually undergraduates from MIT, because they were having a coding, and I think she did some of the writing on the art. So yeah. just, she made a game. It did not as faculty, but it started off as a class project, and that's how she met people. Yeah. And then with PCs, I was thinking in particular with the. Uh, Oh. Like readers or yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think Claudia and I both have yeah. like industry academics, I would call yeah. them. I, as, as our so readers. The Microsoft North New uh, England New research. English research uh, department? Center? But it's Microsoft a research center. Microsoft, Microsoft Nerd, right? <laughs> <laughs> they're literally across the road. Right. Yeah. They're like actually next door to us, and there are some amazing, amazing people who work there. And they come to Colloquium a bunch of times. They come to Colloquium. Cool. Colloquium, and they're there, and they have talks there, and you can go check out their visiting yeah. scholars and so on. So that's, I'm glad you mentioned like some research, that's another networking opportunity. Yeah. But yeah, a, a little bit in the week, so when you write your thesis, you'll have an advisor who's somebody who's CMS faculty that you work closely with, and sort of like share your ideas, share your drafts, but you also uh, have to have at minimum one other reader. And they don't have to come to see us. Um, so, yeah, so we ask people from our like, so like, we really like your work, and I, this is what my thesis is about. Would you be interested in being my reader? And what that means is generally they get early, they get like an advanced copy of your thesis, like a couple of months before you hand it in. Um, so they get to read it first and they get to give you feedback. And they said yes. <laughs> Um, but also, last year there was a project I was really interested in in the Media Lab, because I do sort of the food technology and social media, and they were using food and big data and looking at communities there, and I just emailed them and said, hey, I'm like writing my thesis on this, can I please figure out what's going on? And like once a week I touched base with them and got to kind of help a little bit on the project, but it is, you have to be watch out your time, because you don't have a lot of it. But um, I, it was like part of my thesis work and I, it, people are pretty friendly in that respect. If there's something you're interested in, just send them an email. Or show up at their lab <laughs> yeah. if they don't respond. Um, so there is no representative here from the Open Doc Lab, but I was wondering um, just how practical, I know labs are doing that it's practical, but how hands-on do you get in the Open Doc Lab in terms of like working with equipment? I don't think I'm going to give a, a fully satisfactory response to that. The, the, the Open Doc Lab is not a technical lab where they sit around building VR equipment and headsets all day, for sure. They are bringing in visiting filmmakers. The reason they're not here today is they have a guest speaker and they have to manage that event. Um, they get, uh, they're very, very good fundraisers and they get um, equipment from, like, they can go to, they have all the gear. They have all the gear, yeah. <laughs> they can go to someone and say, we're the MIT Open Documentary Lab. Well, do you have some gear you want to share with us? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. What do you think? Do you want to test it out? And so that's, that's um, uh, you know, where the equipment comes in. So it's not a, a, a sort of building lab with soldering iron and so on. Um, it's, so they're, they're using the equipment they are, but we just added a VR class to the curriculum. So there's another curriculum that will be taught for the, I think it was taught as a special topics class once, and then it will be taught as a primary class um, this uh, spring. Okay? And obviously that's not just the theory and history of virtual reality, that will be the reality experience. But again, it's not a sort of um, uh, strictly technical class. Hopefully that. But that is to say, there are a few people that um, have been RAs in the Open Doc Lab that their thesis work is more hands-on, and I think that's really complemented their work as RAs mm -hmm. very well. Mm -hmm. So I know a lot of people that have been Open Doc Lab RAs have had more technical project-based thesis yeah. work. Or at least had technologies as a complementary component mm -hmm. to a written thesis project. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that might happen a little bit more in Open Doc than in some other labs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I know. Um, there's no one here uh, from the Imagination Computation and Instruction Lab, but, um, and I do want to know more about this lab, and I also discovered that it's also built it under the CTEL department. Yes. So I'm just curious to... I would recommend you emailing Fox Terrell, who runs that lab. He is not here, he's on leave. 
uh, on research leave. Uh, but in my experience, it's been very communicative with students who say, why? I'd like to know more about your lab. Um, and he has, um, is it a press appointment, Shannon, with DSAIL? Or, yeah. Um, so he works with uh, computer science graduate, uh, PhD students. So he's working with our master's students, but he's working with PhD students. <coughs> Um, but he can tell you more. Will, um, will he be looking at applicants from yeah. a more technical background compared to other? Uh, he will not be looking at any applicants this year because he is on leave. So he will not be doing committee work and, and be, you know, be on, the, on that committee, um, presumably. Um, but when we review applicants, we are always thinking, who could this person potentially work with? Um, and so for example, even if someone were on leave, we might say, hey, look at these three students. You know, you're interested in having one of them in your lab next year. Or, you know, look at the whole group. Who looks appropriate for you? So because he is running a lab, he's someone we would check in with, but he wouldn't be like doing the sort of front work of reviewing 100 applications. And, um, because we, we respect uh, people who have done in an office. So, yeah. You don't have to worry about, you know, if you're working in an area and your person is on leave, that's just follow through the cracks completely. That's, that's absolutely not the case. I have another question for each of those. Yeah. Um, in the program, how much of the workload is essays versus hands-on work? And for the thesis, is it possible to do a journalism project or a startup idea, for instance? Most of the work, uh, by which I mean more than 50%, that you are graded on is going to be essay work. Um, there's also going to be oral presentations, uh, different kinds of group projects, but uh, the majority of work is the, um, is the written work. Uh, and uh, I, would, I would have to see specifically what the project was, but the short answer is that no one is going to write a thesis that's uh, their pitch for a startup company and that that's not going to count as an academic research project in your master's degree. Um, so, that said, you might write a thesis that helps you start up that 501c3 when you get out of here, you know, that lays down the groundwork for what you want to do, or lays out the key questions that you would go to funders with, or to a foundation with. So it's not that that work is unrelated to uh, somebody wanting to do a startup, but the, 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 the thesis itself would not be that startup document. Um, I'm, I guess I'm interested in hearing from the students what you think sets MIT's program apart from other media studies programs, or maybe why you decided to come to this program particularly. Yes, <laughs> oh, so you're putting me on the spot. I can or? go first. Okay, if you, you can want to first. Yeah. Thank All you. right. So, as I said before, my background's in journalism, and I was working at the AP in New York for a year before I came here. And when I started thinking about grad school, I was like, this is really great, but there are so many gaps in my knowledge set, right? There are other things related to media, but that aren't necessarily journalism, that I'm interested in and possibly want to work with or explore someday. So, when I was looking for grad programs, I did apply to a couple of journalism ones, but I also applied to CMS because it's more broad. The scope is different. You can look at more issues, more things. You get to explore more because CMS is very, very interdisciplinary in a way that many other programs are not. And for me, that was the big draw because you get to work with media in so many different capacities that might not be possible in other programs. Yeah, and I also kind of agree with that. I was. I majored in American Studies and Media Arts and Sciences, which is like computer science and design, so two interdisciplinary majors, and I still wanted to continue that comparative look at um, technology. And so for me, when I was looking at programs, I was looking at what communication programs also have cross-pollination with um, human-computer interaction, or at least around resources like that. Um, and a lot of the communication programs I was looking at were like, political focused or health focused or um, seemed very focused. <laughs> um, and so I really wanted to go somewhere where I could have like this core of media studies and communication, but I could talk to people in computer science really readily. Or I could talk to somebody who studied um, virtual reality and this stuff. Or I could go and talk to a chef. And that those sort of ventures off would be normalized. <laughs> 
in a way, and I wouldn't have to fight against being able to have like an anthropology person look at my thesis and what would the perspective they would give because we were communications department. Um, and so in CMS, I feel like every single person is doing something totally different from each other, and I love that <laughs> because it really allows you to to be empowered to like have the perspective you want to take while still having a lot of other perspectives of people who have also done kind of different things and how do you make sure it's legitimate while also um, new and interdisciplinary. Yeah, I like looking at uh, the past theses and it didn't seem like there was a, like a formula. Like they were all completely different. Um, and then the same with like, faculty writing. So I looked at like, the books that were published and articles published by faculty and they were all over too, which meant that even if I came with an idea of my thesis, other areas were totally up for grabs. Uh, in my case, I was more, I was, I wasn't, so I'm very focused on studying games. I knew I wanted to uh, study and criticize them, but not necessarily make them. And game studies as a field is, you know, still pretty young. Um, and a lot of uh, even graduate level programs that deal primarily with games have a very kind of professional development oriented uh, outlook. So I was looking for something that wasn't that. The other thing I was looking at actually when I was applying was for the media studies. Um, but what motivated my decision to come here was really that like, I, I was comfortable with some of the media theory, but I didn't want to have to constantly justify why I was applying for games. Mm -hmm. And similarly, I didn't want to go along a sort of a development-focused games track because I didn't want to justify why I wasn't making anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so this was a, you know, a really great option and a really great place for me to kind of bring those two interests together. Uh, and also the other nice thing about interdisciplinarity is that no one's going to yell at you if you decide to stray outside of your field and like use methods from another discipline because like, no way like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. like, it's, it's seen as a plus, that's what everyone's doing. Yeah. And you know, we, we see the strength in that and that's, uh, that's been enormously helpful. For me. Yeah, and I also want to add one thing. Um, what I liked about CMS is that there were people who went into academia and there were people that went into industry and it was totally accepted. Oh. Um, where a lot of the academic pro programs I was looking at, it's like, we're training future scholars. Mm -hmm. And if you end up going into industry, it's like you sort of have betrayed your professors. Or, or you have like let yourself down by not getting an academic job. Um, and in CMS, it's, it's, both are like viewed completely the same way in terms of how people respect them and how people will help you get to where you want to be. Um, and so that was really important for me because I didn't know if I was going to go. I felt like I was going to go into PhD. I still might, but I need time off. <laughs> but I, I was like, I'm not sure, and I don't want to go down a path where I'm going to finish, and the only option is to go into academia. I want to be somewhere where I can finish my master's and say, OK, I'm going to continue into a PhD, or no, I'm going to go and work in industry, and I have the tools I need to do that. And I feel like CMS is definitely enabling me to have those, those dual options. These are all really helpful answers. I'll add that, um, you know, there's a place in the application where you indicate where else you apply. It's helpful for us to see the range of your, your interests that way. And um, in, in that part of the application cannot hurt you. It's just useful information, just so you know. Um, but uh, a, a, a number of people do apply to both PhD programs and master's programs. And then they see where they get in, and then they sort of mm -hmm. weigh and balance everything and figure out, well, what are my priorities? And uh, you know, for some, the tipping point is, well, I got into this prestigious MA pro or MS program, I got into this prestigious PhD program. Do I want academia, you know, the, being a professor mm -hmm. is my only option when I'm done? And for some people, absolutely yes. So yeah, I had to make that decision. I was choosing between a PhD and here. And from here, you can always go on to get a PhD, yeah. but once you're in the PhD, you can't go back and do CMS. It's true. It's very, very <laughs> difficult once you're, you're, you're tainted. <laughs> you just have to be a professor. And uh, of course, then the difficulty is that the job market is particularly fraught right yeah. now. So the, it's very, very kind of, uh, shall we say, Darwinian environment for bringing them into PhDs. And so if you get a, a master's degree that opens you up to a lot of different options, one of them being a PhD, but other ones being industry or not-for-profit work or whatever, you just have more options uh, open to you. Just as a cross-check, it seems to be getting close to that, but what are the comparables? I mean, I'm, I'm here and I, understand, I see the value of this program, but I just wonder, just as an exercise, what would you compare this program to and how are you different from it 
by name? And are there programs where that are less writing based, for instance, as a as a way of comparing? Mm. Uh, there are technically oriented programs. Is there a game program at NYU, for example, that? I still think NYU ITP is a NU and NYU ITP is like a lot more hands-on if you're more of like a maker. I would suggest that. Right, or the media lab. Yeah, or the media hands-on. And you will not be doing writing. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. There are a number of master's programs in limited areas like documentary to claim like it. Uh, I believe Santa Cruz has a documentary training program right now. There is a program in social justice and documentary at um, the New School for Social Research in New York City, right, which would train you to do exactly that, social justice documentaries. So there's some very specific um, programs out there. I don't know how helpful that is, but there is a uh, comparative media studies uh, existing as an undertaking, I guess, at Columbia uh, University, but I do not believe that they currently have a graduate program that's still in the works. I, I need to misspeak because we are being streamed. Yeah. I want some professor to say, how dare you? <laughs> but I believe that they do not have a, a, a PhD component yet specifically in Columbia. I have a question from the interwebs for the students. Mm -hmm. um, what do students do in the summers? Are mm -hmm. there resources for research travel? I can start again. Um, so this past summer, I interned at Google doing user research, um, user experience research in the research and machine intelligence group there. Um, I did have past professional experience in UX research as well. Um, but before I got that, I was planning <laughs> on going to Spain and doing field work, and I was going to get funding through MIT Spain to do that. So there are options. You need to. I'm not, I'm not familiar with CMS options for summer independent thesis work, but there are a bunch of random places at MIT that have money for students to do things in the summer. I know, did you get PKG? I got last week. Okay, so then there's um, the PKG. That's what does what it, did. yeah, how, what does this stand for, Shannon? I'm sorry. Sorry? Uh, it, it's the Priscilla K. Gray Service Fund. Yeah, and we had, I think, two students this past summer um, who used that fund for their summer work. So I think Aziria, who's in our year, uh, went to Argentina. Yeah. Aziria was in Buenos Aires. And working um, with a, an alum, I think, or maybe not. I don't know. I, it wasn't my project. I'm sorry. Um, but then also Marielle, who's also a second year, got funding from there to run a student media workshop in East Boston this summer. Um, so the, the, the short answer is what they do on this during the summer is they do thesis research. You gear up or whatever you need to you know, have under your belt before you start your thesis work in your second year. Sometimes, uh, at the end of the summer, you realize, hey, my thesis is not up, I'm not that at all. Oh, no. <laughs> and that's productive, too. They do, you know, you read 20 or 30 books and realize this isn't exactly what I want to do, and you, you, go, you go in a new direction. But people need to do field work, do that over the summer. People need to gather data. People need to do different kinds of ethnographic research, do that over the summer. There are a lot of pots of money at MIT that you can apply for, not specifically through CMS, though, for summer work, as far as I know. My well, there's the, the Kelly Douglas Fund is, is for research travel and can be used. Oh, yes, it's for research travel, but it's a relatively small amount. Mm -hmm. it's, um, uh, but that is, that's generally used most often for conference travel uh, during the school year. Um, there are uh, some students do summer uh, internships at Microsoft Research, which does provide uh, funded summer internships. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities out there, but you have to be a kind of go-getter. No yeah. one's going to just be like, here's 10 grand for the summer. Go with it. Yeah, you know, you have to be applying for stuff and, and, and getting out there and finding stuff. And uh, of course, Shannon and others are always there to help and mm -hmm. send you to the right website and so on, especially just to find the little, uh, as I said, the pots of money at MIT because it is such a well-funded institute and there are so many different kinds of things you might not think of. You might, you might be thinking, I want to do media research in Mexico City and be looking for media when you should be looking for Mexico City. You should be looking for international funding instead of thinking about your specific media project. Yeah, and I do have a tip of advice. I wish I was applying for grants for my research right when I got here mm -hmm. rather than waiting until my second year because it takes 
foundations like a year to give you money. Yeah. Um, Sorry, so I can't I've, wait on the coffee. I gotta go. <laughs> So I like I found all these pots of money, but they take months and months to process. And so now that I'm the beginning of my second year, they're like, we can give you the money in April. I'm like, that's hopefully when I'll be done. So if you know that you're going to need money for some general topic, maybe you don't know specifically where, when you get here, start looking. Um, yeah, and as a related issue is if you're doing ethnographic work and you need yeah. uh, uh, IRB, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, uh, um, human subjects of Google, basically, that you're going to have to plan ahead for that. It's, they're pretty fast once you get going, but you don't want to just show up to do research and then be like, oops, I didn't get the proper protocols dealt with, you know, ahead of time. Absolutely. So, can I say yes. about the, uh, the question about what other programs people look at, because you know, online, is our communications person is actually tracking them. Um, <laughs> I'm looking at my bookmarks, the other you know, program that I check out every once in a while. Um, the only one that jumps out as particularly hands-on is Georgia Tech's uh, Masters in Digital Media. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a very good example. Um, Thank you. We compete with a lot of programs that are much more theory or the traditional academic uh, thing. So there's the Modern Culture Program at Brown, mm -hmm. there's uh, Art, Art History and Digital Studies at Duke. Um, there's ones that are a little bit closer to what we do. Um, the Communication, Culture, and Technology Program at Georgetown is one. But when I look at the programs, um, man, if we want the first 10 plus years of, of any, anybody that we need to offer uh, admission to, they always came here. It, it was a long time before anybody went to another program. The ones that they had in the last several years have been PhD programs. Um, exactly. We, we almost never lose an admit to a hundred masters. Yeah, that's absolutely right. We, we tend to lose people to a PhD program, or occasionally someone got in, but oh, they just got an amazing job, and they're going to do that instead of going back to school. That kind of thing. But it is unusual for us to move out to another master's program. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Other? Oh, let's, we haven't heard from you yet. Please. Other than, uh, sorry, first. Okay. Uh, other than Nick Monfort's laboratory, is there somewhere else that's doing some literary writing thing related to sound? Or because I'm not, like the thing I have in my mind is like doing something um, about the listening experience in what I suggest called the locomotion media. Mm -hmm. So I think like I. I don't, like my project would not really fit into one lab, mm -hmm. and I don't, I'm not sure if I should apply here to CMS or to DOSP, maybe, mm -hmm. because like I don't want to be an urban, an urban planner, <coughs> I want to do the theory and critical thinking relating sound cities from a literary perspective, that's my background, right? So. <laughs> Maybe it's not a uh, really specific question, but... What a wonderful person, <laughs> person you are. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're yes. worth pointing out the separation between thesis topic and lab. Oh, yeah. Because that oh, yes. seems relevant yes. here. Yeah, that's relevant. Um, okay. uh, you're, you're absolutely right that Turk Tank is the place that would potentially be doing work that would be of great interest to you. But that doesn't mean that you would be in Turk Tank if you came here, depending on who else got in, where people fit, whether or not Trope Tank has any funding that year, what their, you know, what grants they have in the works and so on. So you do not want to come here specifically just because I gotta go to MIT because I gotta work in game lab and you just picked your spot. That is not a good criterion, I think, for coming here. That said, if you want to work, you know, let's say that you wanted to be an open doc lab, but you got an extra studio as your RA mm -hmm. assignment. But open doc lab has meetings uh, almost every week with guest speakers. You know, free sandwiches, and you can hang out, and you know you can participate in other labs. A civic media lab. We have not been able to place people in the civic media lab um, for, I guess, maybe two years, something like that. Um, but people attend those lab meetings if they choose to. You know, so how much time you have in the day. But you know, people who you know can can find ways to connect with the labs that they're not necessarily working for. Um, and uh, if you're open to, okay. To, to connecting in that way, but it's not necessarily your research assignment or your your you know your, uh, your work to, to earn your way. Um, that's fine. 
but I would not recommend anyone choosing us just because I got to get this done to this one lab and work with this one professor and that is the be all and end all because you need to be more flexible and okay. And but can we like apply for two programs? Oh yes, okay. yes. If you wanted to apply, you got You can apply to as many programs as you want. <laughs> yes. Oh, I'm sorry, we had one question over here, and then you? <coughs> how people are assigned to a thesis advisor, or how they pick a thesis advisor? Uh -huh. to, like, a You're not assigned. You pick an advisor. Um, I could speak to that, but maybe you guys could speak to it a little yeah. more directly. I think, do you want to? Sure. I don't know. Um, so the way I went about it is when I started thinking of a thesis topic, I kind of looked at the list of core CMS faculty, because your primary thesis advisor has to be from CMS. And I was just like, hi, I'm thinking about these things. Can I come meet with you for a bit to talk about this? And I think I did that with three different professors towards the end of the first semester, beginning of the second semester. And sort of after my thought process had kind of taken more shape, I went to two of them at the end of the spring semester, and I talked to them again. And sort of based on that discussion and asking them, like, how do you work as an advisor? What is your process for working with grad students? I went back to one professor, and I was like, OK, would you be my thesis advisor? So for me, it was a process of thinking about what the professor is interested in, what I'm interested in, and also how the professor functions as an advisor. Like, do they want to meet you once a week? Do they require that you make a calendar with deadlines? Like, how does that professor work? What do they bring to the table? And then after talking to them and just generally seeing how I felt, picking one. Yeah. I think it's, it's good to just point to the fact that you need the right topic match, someone who can help you with your ideas, but you also need the right sort of approach to work and workflow Absolutely. match. And some people really need a lot of hand molding and need a very, very tight schedule. Other people prefer to be more self-directed. Um, and you need to find the advisor that, that will be the right match for you on those terms. I was just going to say, yeah, for me, like, the biggest consideration is who had the theoretical or topic backgrounds, and the working style was a huge thing for me, because I'm somebody that I like being self-directed. I don't like having tight deadlines. I just get anxiety and do nothing. I'm much better at, like, just have it done by February, and I'll do it. It'll work. <laughs> uh, hopefully. <laughs> we don't know yet. I'm but, <laughs> um, but so it was really important for me to find the professor who would be OK with trusting me with that space. But I also knew that when I sent them an email with work I wanted them to look at, they would be able to give me relevant feedback. Um, because as I said, like I, I, I'm leading, I want my thesis to be able to be read by people in the food industry, not just be like a very academic text. So I didn't want to be working with a professor who, who's only zoned into academic writing and into theory. I wanted somebody who would help me be able to write my thesis in a way that would be more readable by a general population. So I think that also is like tone in who are the people that know your audience as well. I, uh, yeah, when I came in and wanted to settle on a general area of interest, I, you know, would just like talk to the person, especially in the first semester, there are often a lot of events where it's like, hey, meet the faculty, uh, you know, hang up and chat, and so I'd be like, I want to write a thesis on this topic, what do you think about it? So I could figure out like how much you would get, but like how familiar they were with the topic, where they were, how they approached it, and then I picked out like one or two professors I might approach, uh, and then I actually had one-on-one -on -one meetings with them where I said like, this is what I need out of an advisor. How do you do it? Um, and I mean, you don't have to officially declare an advisor until about October of your second year, so you have some time. Um, and yeah, I'm happy with the advice. But I also straight up told my advisor, like, just please constantly reassure me about my thesis topic at the end of every meeting. <laughs> and it's been great for my like mental well-being. <laughs> uh, would recommend. Yeah. You probably don't. No, I don't. No. <laughs> it's probably exactly what Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But basically, uh, it's sort of like shopping. <laughs> you need to try on a lot of different things and you know, until you find the right match. Um. So how big are, I don't know if there's an answer for this, but how big typically are the research labs? Like how many people are working in this lab, that lab, the other lab? Um, and are all the research people in the labs from CMS or are they from around MIT? Uh, it varies. Uh, so some of the labs are very small. Nick come up with one or two students um, based on undergrads or interested in internships or whatever. Uh, 
uh, we heard from a uh, representative from uh, the uh, Mobile Experience Lab, the design studio, right in after that, um, who said, you know, well, we have uh, CMS students, but we also we have them from all over the institute. Um, and the size, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know if uh, Andrew or Shannon could give a general, like, the size seems to be sort of two to maybe three pages. Is that a good guess? Yeah, how many people are here as a teaching assistant staff? So we have uh, six full time district staff, and we have typically two master's students, uh, like one from St. Mary's, and then we have a girl. Yeah, I think that's about the top of the bell curve. Mm -hmm. And then the other side would be the, the design lab, where there's um, many undergraduates, many graduate students, many research staff, and then Nick Markford's Trope Tank, which is much, much smaller. Yeah, yeah we just came in a room with a lot of awesome old game systems and computers and with, uh, presses and letter presses and so on. Um, and, you know, and some of them have, you know, full time administrative assistants, and some of them have half time, and some of them have no administrative assistants. So it really varies. Any other questions? Any questions about the application process? And the question about like funding and like your savings account or something like that. Yeah, um, what's helpful there is if you already know that you have funding, and this this tends to be I I would say more from uh, international students. Who may have support from their government that you know, will provide X amount of money for international research. Um, people who come in with that kind of support, we, we would like to know. You know, if you got ten thousand dollars from the Portuguese government towards grad studies, great. Um, uh, you you do not have to tell us the contents of your savings account. We don't we don't want to. Um, Right. We don't want to drain your savings account. The most important thing for you to do is in the online application. There is a box that asks if you are interested in financial aid. Please check yes, because that is what makes you eligible for the research assistantship, which provides full tuition plus a moving stipend. Health insurance. And really good health insurance. And, and health insurance. Yes. 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 Um, and for international students, you do not have to submit the financial certification form until you are admitted. That is a separate process that has to do with um, the F1 visa application, and that doesn't have to happen until you've been admitted. So just in the application, check the box that says, yes, I'm interested. It's a fairly simple response. And you will be considered for a research assistant. And I think I read somewhere that the funding is um, kind of tied to one of the labs. And also another question, um, do you all have a preference for a CV or a resume or both? Or doesn't matter whether you're formatted as a, as a CV or more conventional resume. I'll just say that sometimes resumes, people think I can only have one page front and back. And obviously, we want all your experience. So that's, we don't care if it's one page is long or five pages or 20 pages. Just we want to see your uh, experiences, education background, so on, in a reasonably properly formatted manner. Okay. Um, other questions? We've had a good two hour run here. We put in five minutes earlier. All right, well, let me remind you that we have this uh, colloquium in, once again, the room is uh, 56114. 56 is the building. Type in room 114. That is from 5 to 6 30. Um, that's with, with uh, our four alumni and on a panel. Lots of time for QA, a a little reception at the end. Um, so I hope that many uh, of you can attend that. Feel free to follow up with any uh, questions of the email. Um, and thank you all for coming.